Welcome to the non-volatile memory chapter. Our main focus here will be on using flash and FRAM non-volatile memories. This chapter begins with a brief look at what is a microcontroller. Then we explore the actual flash and FRAM technologies a little bit. Next, we look at two types of non-volatile memory, flash and FRAM, as those are both types that are used on the MSP430 family. The third item on our list is memory maps and linking. Since we're going to be using these memories in a slightly non-standard way, for example, putting persistent data into non-volatile memory, we're going to have to do something unique with the linker command file. The final two sections of the chapter look at using flash and using FRAM along with the MPU. Here we'll explore how each of these has been implemented on the MSP430, as well as looking at the code and tools that we can use to program them. Finally, we finish with the lab exercise. What is a microcontroller? Well, it's a microprocessor with additional components, peripherals and memory, things that are required to turn it into a full system on a chip. Nowadays, the MCU tends to be dominated by memory, and that's what we're focusing on in this chapter. By the way, Texas Instruments received the patent for the first microcontroller back in 1971. Let's turn to the subject of non-volatile memory. Usually, the largest memory segment on microcontrollers is non-volatile memory. This type of memory retains its information, even after power has been removed from the system. This is where most users store their program code in initialization constants. Back in the early days of microcontrollers, non-volatile memory was dominated by EEPROM technology. Today, most devices use flash memory, although in the last couple of years, TI started using FRAM technology on some of the MSP430 devices as it can help save a lot of system power. Here's a comparison of four memory technologies often found on microcontrollers. While most of them use SRAM for variables and temporary storage, they also require one of the other three to provide persistent storage. Four things really make FRAM ideal. It uses significantly less power, especially for memory writes. By the way, the, the numbers shown here are for writing a 13K block of data. Two, you can also write data significantly faster with FRAM. Three, just look at that endurance number. I don't think we've actually worn one of them out yet. And finally, four, it's just so darn flexible. Since you can read and write to it as easily as SRAM, you can use it for either purpose, storing program code or temporary variables. The low power, high speed writes of FRAM are a natural for many applications. But we've even seen folks choose FRAM based devices because it speeds up their production lines. That is, they find themselves spending a lot less time per unit burning the firmware into their microcontrollers. Oh, and if you want to do firmware updates wirelessly to a remote system, the low power writes are critical to making your batteries last a long time. On the other hand, the big benefit for flash is that you can read it up to the full speed of our fastest MSP430 devices. Up to this point in the workshop, we haven't needed to know anything about memory or the tools pertaining to memory. We've been able to get by using the default linker command file provided by TI for each of our MSP430 variants. Though, if you want to start using non-volatile memory to store persistent data, we'll need to understand a few details of how information gets stored into specific memory locations. In other words, we need to learn a little bit about how linking works. Talking about memory, let's take a quick look at where most folks store their information. As shown here, most users put their program into main memory, that is, main flash or main FRAM. As we said previously, SRAM is where most of our volatile data goes, such as variables on the stack and so on. Finally, the info blocks, A, B, C, and D, were provided for storage of persistent data, things like calibration constants and the like. These are just common suggestions though. As the architecture doesn't place any limits on where things can reside, you can put them anywhere in defined memory space. Of course, as we just got done saying, you have a lot more flexibility on the FRAM based devices. Still, these suggestions are a good place to start. What are code sections? To understand sections, let's start by looking at a short, simple C program. Notice how the different parts of the program in this diagram are color-coded differently. The global and static variables, shown with blue, need to be stored in volatile RAM-like memory, whereas the code and C initialization values, shown in gray and pink respectively, need to be stored in ROM-like non-volatile memory. Finally, we threw in a printf for good measure, even though a real-world program wouldn't use such a thing. Note, though, that standard I.O. routines require sizable RAM-like buffers. As compilers and assemblers generate code from C files, 
They break your code down into these various groupings, which are called sections. There are even common default names for each of these sections of your program. As you can see, global variables go into a section called .bss. Yes, .bss is a weird name. Maybe .var would have been better, but 30 years ago, someone came up with the name .bss and it stuck. By the way, .bss stands for block starting with symbol, as in reserving a block of memory. Most of the others are better named. .cinit for C initialization tables, .stack for the stack, and .cio for standard I.O. buffers. The only other one shown here is the name for a section of code. The name, .text, is another odd one. Again, while .code might have been more intuitive, .text has been around a long time. Here's a table that shows most of the section types created by the TI compiler. In fact, we just got done talking about five of the rows on this table. Also, notice how the table is broken into two halves. One, the top half represents the information that needs to be stored persistently, such as in a non-volatile memory like flash or FRAM, while the bottom half needs to go into a RAM-like read-write memory. Please refer to the Compiler User's Guide for a complete list of sections that are generated by the TI compiler, as well as for more detailed descriptions of each of these sections. Now that we've briefly discussed what memory is on our device and what sections of code and data we have in our programs, it's time to look at how the linker combines the two. That is, how it maps sections into memory locations. To review, the linker tool combines object code coming from your compiled source files and from libraries into an executable output file. Along with the executable.out file, the linker also creates a map file, which is a report describing where all of the sections and global symbols were allocated. The linker command file is the key to making all of this work. Sure, the linker can run without the command file, but the resulting program probably wouldn't work. Hmm, what does the linker command file look like? The linker command file shown here is a simplified version of the default file provided by TI for each of its MSP430 devices. From this, we hope you can get a basic understanding of how it works. Linker command files mostly consist of two parts. One, a description of the available memory, that is, what memory can the linker allocate stuff to? Notice how the one on this page matches our F5529 memory map. Two, the sections part of the linker command file tells the linker where to put each section. For example, this file tells the linker to place the .bss section, that is the global variables, into RAM. Likewise, the code, which is the .txt section, has been linked into Flash. As a side note, the linker does allow for some pretty sophisticated memory allocations. For example, we did leave in a few advanced operators that are found in TI's default linker command files. For instance, the braces allow you to describe specific files that are to be linked. That is, if we put a file name in the braces after .bss, we would be saying, put the .bss section from that file into RAM. Another option is the double greater than operator. This tells the linker that it can split the section into pieces so that it can be allocated into one or more memory ranges. In fact, you can see the OR symbol used on the same line saying that the .tex section can be split up and go into flash or flash2. We spoke just a minute ago about the specific sections that a compiler creates. In fact, it only creates those few sections as defined in the compiler user's guide. But you can create your own custom name sections. The key to creating your own section names is to use either the code or data section pragmas. Why would you do this? By creating your own unique sections, we can now link information to very specific locations in memory, as opposed to it just going into generic predefined sections. That said, we highly recommend that you use this feature judiciously. In other words, don't create custom sections unless necessary. Each time you create a section, you'll need to make sure it's linked properly as we'll see on the next slide. Creating extra sections for no good reason can just cause an administrative hassle, but they're perfect for those times when you need to play something very specifically. Let's see how our modified linker command file handles these new custom section names. As you can see, we link the section critical to a specific address. While this isn't done very often, it is a valid way to link a section. And we also linked myvar to RAM. But what about the section name .txt colon underscore ctrl that we created? Well, the colon in the name means that it's a subsection. That is, underscore ctrl is a subsection of .txt. 
We don't specifically call it out in the linker command file. Subsections just get allocated along with their parent section, in this case, .text. Now that we've completed a brief overview of memory maps and linking, let's turn our attention to how we can use Flash in our programs. MSP430 devices have a Flash controller that handles all of the hardware requirements for writing to Flash. Though, there are a few things we need to keep in mind. First, you can't write directly to Flash memory addresses. Doing so will cause an interrupt or, or a reset. Instead, you need to follow a procedure for writing to Flash memory. Oddly enough, writing to Flash only writes zeros. Before you can write, you actually need to erase the Flash, which writes the ones. Finally, you have to erase a whole Flash segment at one time, even if all you want to do is write a byte. On that note, this diagram shows the flash segment sizes for the F5529. Except for the info memories, which are 128 bytes long, the segment sizes are 512 bytes. Driver Library makes flash relatively painless to use. It wraps up the procedure and all the difficulties into a few easy to call API functions. We've highlighted three functions here that we'll see in the code on the next slide. As an example, say we wanted to write some calibration data to info C. We'd use three driver library functions to do this. One, to erase the flash. Two, we want to make sure that it's been erased properly. And finally, three, we use the flash write functions to write the data itself. Thankfully, this function takes care of all the nitpicky rules needed for writing to flash. What about using FRAM? Like flash, there's an FRAM controller that handles the reading and writing of the actual FRAM memory. Unlike Flash, though, we don't need to any fancy driver library functions to read and write to memory. Remember, it's just like accessing SRAM. Here's a simple but typical use of FRAM. Because we can use it for variable data, we might see it being used for three different things. One, program code. Two, constant or you know, non-volatile data, as well as variable data. So far, this looks great. FRAM provides us with this great flexibility but looking more closely at this, what could go wrong? If you said to yourself, what happens if there's a stack overflow, you're on the right track. The real problem is, if FRAM is so easy to write to, what prevents accidental writes into my program code addresses? Thinking of this, the idea of a stack overflowing is the first thing that comes to most people's minds. But of course, there are other reasons for accidental writes. Why wasn't this a problem with Flash? Well, because as we just said, any direct writes to Flash can cause an exception. That's not the case with FRAM. So then, how do we solve this problem? We use the memory protection unit, also known as the MPU, that TI has added to its FRAM devices. In this way, we can protect our code. Basically, the MPU lets us segment the FRAM into three parts. We can then apply read, write, and execute permissions to each segment, as shown here. By default, the FRAM is set up as one segment that has all the permissions. But it's easy to configure the MPU. It has two registers in which you specify the address boundaries between each segment. So the MPU watches each access to FRAM and prevents any unauthorized access. If an incorrect access is attempted, the MPU throws an interrupt or a puck reset. In order to use the MPU, you first need to configure its boundary addresses and permissions. This can be done via driver lib functions or a GUI. Let's take a look at that GUI first. Code Composer Studio version 6 contains a graphical tool for setting the MPU's configuration. Its intuitive display makes the MPU easy to set up. Notice how, in this screen capture, you can manually configure all of the settings. Another option is to let the GUI tool automatically configure the MPU settings for you. In this way, you don't have to think or worry about the MPU at all, yet you still get all of its benefits. But how does the tool know what settings to use? TI's default linker command file is the key to how the GUI can configure the MPU automatically. This CMD file makes frequent use of the linker's group command, which allows the linker to group sections together. In this case, they're creating a single group that contains all of the information going into FRAM. This FRAM group is further broken down into three groups. In fact, the same three groups that we just spoke about a minute ago. One, the read-write memory group for RAM-like allocations. Two, the read-only group for initialized data like CNIT. And finally, the executable memory group 
for our code. Along with the group commands, they use one other piece of magic in this file. Notice the run start commands. These create global symbols that correlate to the first address in each output section. In other words, these run start commands create three global variables that we can use in our programs, one for each of the three groups we just listed. This makes the GUI's job easy. It just assigns two of these symbols to the memory segment registers and voila, it all automatically works. And if you want to manage the FRAM initialization manually, that is in your own code, let's look at an example of that. We just need to write a configuration function that uses these driverlib function calls. In fact, just like the GUI, we can use the global symbols created by TI's linker command file. Let's look at an example of this. Here's a simple init MPU function. Notice at the top of the file, we extern the symbols that were created by the linker. This gives us access to them. Next, we've got three functions we need to call. One sets up our three FRAM memory segments and assigns the permissions to each segment. Two, we can elect what happens if a violation occurs. Do we want an interrupt or a puck reset? And three, we need to start the MPU. So for both FRAM and Flash, we've used driver lib functions to help us get the job done. One of the key differences between each of these is that in the FRAM's case, it's the initialization code. We just run it once. In the Flash case, every time we do a write, we have to go through using that function, which takes time because it's handling a whole Flash writing procedure for us. OK, now that we've set up our MPU, what does the code look like to store a persistent, that is non-volatile, variable into FRAM? In this case, we chose InfoB. Like we said just a minute ago, essentially, there's nothing fancy that needs to be done, unlike the flash memory case. We only need to do two things. One, make our persistent variable be allocated from the InfoB memory using the pound pragma data section directive. And two, declare the section to be of type no init in the linker command file. If you don't do this, the code generation tools automatically initialize the memory location to zero every time we start up our code. One last item for your FRAM initialization routine is to set the wait states. Per the FR5969 datasheet, if you're running more than 8 megahertz, you need to set the FRAM for one wait state. An example shown here shows a clip from the datasheet as well as the driver lib function that would be required to set the wait states. But since our labs are only running at 8 megahertz, we don't have to worry about the wait state value. We've reached another lab exercise. This lab involves one or two parts. Part A is for both FRAM and flash devices. It has us creating a persistent variable in info memory. We use this to count the number of times the launch pad is power cycled. Each time you reset the system and restart your program, the variable's count is incremented then our program will blink the LED that many times. Oh, and we'll print out the number to the CCS console too. Part B is just for FRAM devices at this point. We configure the MPU using driver lib as described in this chapter. 